Well, it's time for another video, and in this one, we are going to be covering the process of making a one-piece head mold for a tip bucket, of all things. So what I'll be doing in this video, this is the first part of this process, I'll be making a one-piece seamless mold that pulls off like a sock supported by a plaster banded shell. And then in the follow-up video, I'll be showing how I cast this using translucent resin to make a tip bucket for my friend Danny. Now, Danny, of course, is a longtime friend of the Brick in the Yard family, and of course has the distinction of being probably the most molded individual in the Brick in the Yard universe in both uh, live workshops as well as some of our videos. So when Danny asked me for a copy of her head as a tip bucket, it was impossible to say no, and I thought this would make for a cool project for this channel. So follow along. This is again going to be a two-part video explaining both the mold making process as well as the casting process. Now, as I've mentioned before in some of the mold planning and mold theory videos, it's always a good idea to start with what your casting material will be and then work backwards. So for this, we're going to be casting our finished head bucket in TC821 translucent resin. And if you didn't see my previous video about this where I cast up a copy of my head as a vampire bus, definitely check that out. I'll link that on the end screen. I found that TC821 did a great job of replicating the translucency of human skin, but in a hard plastic. So that's ideal for display busts and pieces like medical simulators and things that need to be cast in hard plastic, but still look like organic tissue. And as you see from this cast of this resin ear, light passes through it just enough to offer that realistic translucent look of organic tissue. But again, in the form of a hard plastic. And as many of you know, obviously translucent soft skin materials are really handy, but there are also times when you might need a skin material to look like skin but be a hard plastic again for the medical simulator world as well as display busts and things like that. Now this is an old monster clay pour from a silicone life cast mold and I had this sitting around and I still have some other plans for this. I might do some other interesting projects with uh, Danny's head. I still want to come back to this and maybe sculpt the eyes open, maybe uh, sculpt her into a creature mutant or something like that. So I wanted to make a mold directly off of this clay copy, but I didn't want to destroy the original clay piece. So what I wanted to do is just isolate just the head and lower part of the neck, just the base of the neck, uh, again, just for that kind of head bucket look. So I'm just gonna isolate just that part of the head and just mold that area. But again, I want to preserve this clay copy as much as possible because I don't have the original mold now. So I want to have that clay copy to go back to later. Now in the future, hopefully I'll get into actually scanning instead of life casting, but that's a whole other video. So in order to isolate the head in the part of the mold that I want to make, what I'm going to do is cut up some paper cups and create a little shim dividing wall to isolate the head from the shoulder area. And the reason I'm doing this instead of like brass stock or, you know, metal shims shoved into the clay is this is much easier to clean up. So here what I'm doing, I've just cut out those uh, wax paper cups and I'm using the countertop there to straighten those out. And those of you unfamiliar with this method of making shims like this, definitely check out my full length video on the shim technique for multi-piece molds. And definitely check that out because what I'm doing here is uh, a modified form of the shim technique I use in that video. But basically the idea here is by using these wax paper cups to create a little dividing wall and then pinning those in place with quilting pins, what that does is that does minimal harm to that clay sculpture. So later on when I peel off the silicone mold and I take the shims off, I don't have to do a lot of corrective work to get back to the original clay sculpture. So my main intent here is to have this clay positive preserved so I can do more with this later on. So this is just a good technique to file away for those of you where you want to mold part of a sculpture and you want to have a really clean flange on that finished mold, uh, but you don't necessarily want to use brass shims or something like that stuck into the mold, and you don't want to build a clay wall. It's just a much faster and cleaner way to do that. So what I'm doing is just taking those wax paper shims that I've created from those wax paper cups, and then taking the quilting pins and then putting them carefully into that cup so that they're parallel to the shim material and go right in there and hold that uh, shim wall that I'm creating uh, right at a right angle to the neck. 
And then those gaps between those shim pieces, I'm filling those in with clear packing tape. So that's what I'm doing right there. It's taking some clear packing tape and then folding that over or putting a piece on one side and a piece on the other side. So you have kind of a little packing tape sandwich, closing the gaps between all those pieces of shim material. Now, normally I would put those quilting pins on the underside, but for the sake of the video and those of you unfamiliar with that shim technique, I put those on the top side mainly so you can see where those are and it makes a little bit more sense what I'm doing here. But typically I would put those pins on the underside when I'm doing this technique so that I don't have to pull those pins out of the silicone. So again, this is more for the sake of the video than for the actual function of the mold. So if you're doing this, definitely put the quilting pins on the underside. Now once I've done that I'm going to spray some Zip 301 mold release and anytime you're painting or using an aerosol like this always a good idea to work in a well ventilated area. Uh, my workshop I've recently moved to an old hair salon so I actually have uh, vents now built in for uh, the old nail work that they used to do to get the uh, smell of acrylic nails out so that has worked out famously. So there you get a good look at the entire shim wall built there. And now we are ready to start smearing silicone. Now the silicone I'm going to be using for this is TC5110F. F is of course for fast. So this is a fast setting one-to-one -one, about a five shore A silicone and we're going to be thickening it using the SC5001 thickening agent. Now TC5110F fast setting 5A silicone this is typically a pourable silicone. If you get this and just mix up the parts A and B, you're going to wind up with a low viscosity, fast setting pourable silicone. But by adding that 5001, the SC5001 thickening agent, we convert that to a brushable paste that will stay on a vertical surface. And that is crucial to making a successful brush on mold without a lot of lost material dripping off of your piece. So here I'm measuring out my equal parts of A and B. And again, this can be done by weight or volume with this formula. And then once I've dispensed that, I'm going to add some silicone pigment and some of the SC5001 thickening agent. Now the silicone pigment I'm adding is optional. I mainly do that just to help me track the progress of how much silicone I'm applying. This is one of the things that came up in the Brick in the Yard Facebook group the other day. Someone was asking about uh, how to track your progress on brush on molds. And probably the best, most consistent way to do that is by pigmenting your layers different colors. And that way you can see without a doubt where your coverage is and make sure each layer is completely covering the previous layer. So when you can't see that original color of your first layer, that's a pretty good indicator that everything is properly covered. And just make sure that that you get good total coverage on your piece. Especially when you're working with translucent silicones like this, these formulas are really nice because you can use them for uh, casting applications as well as mold making. But typically when I'm doing mold making with this, I do like to add some pigment to it just so I can see how thick I'm building everything up. So here I'm adding my SC5001 thickening agent. And once that's stirred in, that starts converting that from, again, a flowing liquid to a thixotropic paste. And if we go about a full 1%, it's going to be really thick. And you'll see that in the second coat. I'm just going to do this with two layers of silicone. So the first layer, I wanted it to have a little bit of slump to it. Um, but not so much that everything just ran off the piece. And that was to avoid having to do multiple coats and do a print coat because overall this is a really simple mold and if I'm careful applying this first layer I can make sure that's uh, relatively bubble free. So again once I've got everything mixed up I'm ready to start painting that onto my model. Now with TC5110F this has a about a seven to eight minute working time at room temperature and then about a one hour demold also at room temperature. And of course, anytime I'm using these cheap brushes, I always like to pull out any of the loose hairs before I start just to make sure those don't wind up in that first layer of silicone. And now I'm ready to start applying that silicone over my model. So again, it has just enough slump there that I can pour it out over the top and then just guide it as it runs down the piece and then just go around and kind of scrub the surface a little bit with a soft brush and make sure I don't have any air bubbles in mainly the areas around the eye sockets, the nose, and especially the ears. Typically when you're molding a head like this, the main areas that are gonna be prone to air entrapment are the uh, undercut areas around the ears, the nostrils, and the eyes. 
And for those of you that want to see a more complete process of making a silicone head mold like this, definitely check the end screen. I'll link to the silicone head mold I did in a previous video. And that goes into much greater detail about the entire process and also using uh, a couple of different silicone formulas. And again, once I get everything totally covered on the head, I want to make sure also that I cover that flange and then just go back and make sure I work in uh, that silicone into all those undercut areas. I'm filling the undercuts and also working out any air bubbles on the surface. Now, the other thing you want to have in mind here, and I go into this a lot more in that two part video on a silicone head mold, is you want to make sure you have a plan for how this mold is going to come apart. So for this piece, I'm actually going to uh, separate it, the shell in two halves going front to back. So all of the undercut areas that I'm filling in are with that strategy in mind. So ultimately the shell will run from the nose to the back of the head. And you'll see that here in a minute. But you want to have a good plan of attack for exactly how you're going to do that. And the reason I chose that strategy as opposed to making the shell in two pieces front to back is this would be the most conservative use of silicone for this piece. And the whole idea here is I wanted to make a quick and dirty mold off of this head cast so that I could make a few of these little head buckets and be done. And you still want, obviously, in a situation like this, you still want a good usable mold that you can pull out and use again. But uh, this mold, I know going into this, I'm only going to pull maybe half a dozen copies out of it. So this is my second and final layer. Typically, if I was going to make a mold that I was going to be using in production, I would do at least three, if not four layers, and definitely do a real runny print coat to get all that surface detail really good. But for this, it really wasn't necessary. So on my second coat, I made this even thicker, doing that full 1% of the Thixotropic additive. And then once I brushed that all over my piece, I came back with a, a tongue depressor and a stir stick and used that to smooth out the outside. So what you want there is just get that outside as smooth as you can so that that shell doesn't grab on uh, any places on the silicone where you have those little rough like frosting kind of peaks. And you want that for two reasons. You want it both for eliminating the undercuts on the original part, but also you want that nice and smooth so that that uh, support shell or your mother mold doesn't misalign and cause distortions in your resin cast later on. And now what I'm doing, I've just cut up a trash bag and I'm putting that around to protect my work surface so that I can make my plaster bandage mother mold. And this is another one of those processes I've covered in a lot of previous tutorials. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it here, but the main thing to know is definitely use high grade, extra fast set bandages. You don't wanna use the hobby store bandages like rigid wrap. Those do not make good competent mold shells. So anytime you're doing a mother mold like this and you want it to hold up well over time, make sure you're using good quality uh, medical grade plaster bandages. And that doesn't necessarily mean more expensive. In fact, these are actually cheaper than like the rigid wrap and some of the hobby store kind of bandages, but these are bandages that typically you're gonna have to find from a uh, mold supplier, like say somebody like uh, Fox and Superfine or a medical supplier, but you're not gonna find these higher grade bandages at hobby stores but it makes a huge difference in the quality. And I'm sure somebody will point that out in the, the comment section as well. Those of you who have been that down that trail know the sadness that comes with using uh, poor quality plaster bandages for mother molds. If this is done right, uh, you will have a plaster bandage mother mold that will last 20 or more years. I've got molds in my personal mold library that are well over 20 years old with shells like this and still serve me very well. Now the $1,000 plumbing tip I'm gonna hide here in the middle of the video is to use that bucket of warm water that you're using to activate those plaster bandages. Also use that to clean your hands. And when you're done with that water, do not pour it down your drain. Take that water and either set it outside to let it dry or just pour it into the ground outside, but do not pour it in your drain. So thank me later for the plumbing money I just saved you. Now before I make the second half, since it's going to overlap, the first half of the shell, I'm going to apply some release. Here I'm using Pardol Paste Wax. You can also use the red can, the high temp paste wax for this. And you can also use Vaseline, but I really prefer paste wax because it dries, whereas Vaseline does not dry, will stay kind of oily. So just a lot cleaner to uh, use paste wax over Vaseline. 
Now, if you are unfamiliar with this method of making a plaster bandage mother mold, definitely check out the links on the end screen because I go into much greater detail on some previous tutorials on this. So definitely check those out if uh, this process is new to you. But basically what I'm doing is taking plaster bandage material that's been layered at least three layers thick. And then I dip it in that warm water to activate it and then apply it to my piece to make that mother mold. And each layer overlaps the previous layer, locking that all together and it makes a really nice, strong, durable mold shell. Now, I wouldn't do this for making molds for concrete or something like that that's going to have a lot of hydraulic pressure pushing out on the mold, but something like this where I'm going to be doing a, a slosh cast resin copy, this is perfect. It's lightweight, it's inexpensive, and works great for this kind of application. So now once I've smoothed all that out, I'm ready to let that sit and dry. And typically, if you're using good quality extra fast set bandages like this, um, let those sit and dry after you make the final section of your mold for at least an hour or so. And then they'll be more than strong enough to be able to pry those apart. So here, just one last little piece of bandage material. And all in all, this took, I think, two six inch bandages and one four inch plaster bandage roll. So uh, again, very small, very minor use of plaster bandages. And overall, this is a very economical mold to make. Didn't take a whole lot of silicone and didn't take many plaster bandages. And I'll put the actual weight of the mold in the video description along with all the uh, product links. So definitely check that out. Um, so you can see exactly how much silicone this took me to make this mold. And uh, again, I'll put the links to the silicone as well as the thickening agent and all that as well. Now I demolded this about an hour or an hour and a half or so later. The first thing I do after removing the uh, halves of my mother mold, I'm ready to carefully remove that shim material. And I say carefully mainly because we want to be careful not to mar that uh, clay positive any more than absolutely necessary. I just don't want to have to do any more re-sculpting than I absolutely need to do to that piece. So once I peel away the shim material, then I'm going to carefully remove any of those little quilting pins that are stuck in the silicone. And now we're ready to carefully peel off our one piece silicone head mold. And one of the nice things about monster clay is it doesn't require any kind of sealer. It's sulfur free. So I don't have to worry about that inhibiting the platinum silicone. And here I'm just using some baby powder to lubricate the outside of that mold so that will slide over itself without catching. And again, the whole point of doing the process this way is I want to preserve that uh, clay positive as much as possible so that I can use that for a future project. So here I'm just rolling that over the clay positive. And there you see we have our clay positive largely unscathed with minimal cleanup. It will live to see another project. And now my uh, silicone mold is nested in my mother mold and we are ready for casting. So stay tuned for part two. In part two, I'll be making a slosh cast hollow resin positive and doing that, of course, with that TC821 translucent resin. And then, of course, finishing that out to look like a uh, somewhat stylized, but still fairly realistic uh, looking tip bucket out of Danny's head. So thanks for watching and be sure to check out the material links in the video description. And big thanks to Danny for asking for this because this was definitely a cool, fun little project to make. So uh, again, stay tuned for part two. Now also be sure to check the links on the end screen for the tutorials I mentioned earlier. And as always, thanks for watching.